so chapter two is called the perception of self and others and this may be um, you know particularly challenging uh, chapter for some of you guys because as I said you know you not being from the West this is a very Western view and how Westerners see themselves uh, is very unique <laughs> you know uh, if you come from the East that is not your perspective uh, because self in the East is not as much of a big deal as self it is in the West. Mm -hmm. I know if you're familiar with this, but if you have been studying world cultures in general, you would know that some cultures are what we call collectivistic cultures and other cultures are what we call individualistic cultures. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is that some cultures tend to focus more on me as one person. Life, I am at the center and everybody else in life is not as important as I am. And all the decisions I make are really all about what I want in life, how I want to proceed, what I want to achieve, and what other people want, not as important, okay? Now, in a collectivistic society, the very identity of a person is a lot of times minimized. It's not about me, it's about us. It's always about family. It's all about what family wants. It's all about what your immediate surrounding of people really care about that actually defines what you're gonna do in life, how you're gonna pursue your career or anything else. So a lot of decisions that are being made in a personal life of, of a individual are actually made for them by the people who surround them. And that's normal for a collectivistic society. Now, the West is not a collectivistic society. The West is a very individualistic society where everything is focused on achieving of your own personal goals that have to do with you, with your desires, your wants, and things like that. And so, and sometimes I find that the people who come from an Eastern culture struggle with understanding that concept of self. So please just keep that in mind as your uh, prelude, sort of say, uh, to what we're gonna be discussing uh, in this chapter. So, um, by the way, if, you, if, if I run into a section of the chapter you want me to zero in a little bit more, you want me to talk more about or explain a particular concept, something in a textbook said that you do not understand, that you want me to go into it deeper, or just clarify it, please let me know, just raise hands. So, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the lecture, you know, as I normally do, uh, just kind of, you know, section by section, point by point, but, but if there's something that you want me to talk more about, you're just maybe just curious, that's okay. I want you to be curious about these things and ask questions. You know, if there's something that interests you and say, you know, I want to know more about this. Let's, you know, what else, what else is out there? Uh, so let's have a discussion about it. Because in the end, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is I'd like for you to participate in this course. And participation means you have to show some sort of a, you know, engagement. Uh, and I'm sure there are things that we're studying here that are of interest to you. It's not possible to not be interested in human communication because every single one of us communicates and every single one of us runs into problems communicating. I mean, not one of us in this room is sitting that has never had a problem communicating and wouldn't love to overcome that at some point because who wants to live in a life mired with problems, right? You want to become better at anything you do, you know, because that means success. So I know that you have a vested interest in these things, and, but just don't be shy about voicing uh, your questions or thoughts or you know even opinions it's perfectly fine we can uh, discuss these things all right so um, on our chapter two we have several learning objectives objectives um, one being uh, define your um, self define your self concept okay that's our ob objective number one self-awareness self-esteem uh, explaining the ways in which the self-awareness and same self-esteem may be increased. Again, as I said, this is a very Western idea, uh, perhaps maybe foreign to you, but that's okay. Uh, we can explore that for a little while. Uh, our second objective is define self-disclosure. What in the world is self-disclosure? There are rewards and there are dangers to self-disclosure, and I want you to be able to understand um, you know how how this actually happens. How do you respond to to it? How how does this? How do you navigate this idea of self disclosure? Uh, objective number three we have is define perception. 
and different stages of perception. Now that's a really actually big deal. Perception is a big deal. Most people do not realize how important uh, awareness of our perception is. Uh, and then uh, objective four, describe the nature of impression information and the major factors uh, that uh, influence. Again, that's uh, uh, also related to the perception uh, topic. And then also explain and give examples of the strengths of impression. Impression is a pretty big deal at this point. You're probably um, starting to, to track this. So if you love, read the chapter, maybe you have already um, realized what we're talking about and how how important it is. So uh, we will um, break up our chapter in just segments and just go go through it. And um, as questions come up, please please do ask me questions. Uh, that's you know very very welcome. So let's talk about the idea of self self in communication. Now the idea of self in the big picture, but you know self in communication is since this is a communication course, what we're really interested in is what does that mean, uh, self and self-esteem, as far as it comes to us being able to speak to everyone else around us or, or write, it doesn't matter what type of communication. And can, can it be, you know, how much does our understanding of self affect us? Uh, so what is self-concept? What do you guys think it means? What does that stand for? How would you explain it to me? Self-concept is how you do what? Just in your own words. I understand um, myself. Exactly. So self-concept is how do you see yourself? Like if I asked you, tell me, who are you? Describe yourself to me. And you have three minutes. I don't want your entire history, you know, where you were born, and then, I don't, I just, just, you can just tell me, you know, I am, you know, uh, an artist who loves to do this, and, uh, and, you know, and you will define yourself to me in some way. You'll choose some parts of your personality that you would think that are important for me to know about you, and you would say, this is who I am, you know? You know, when people ask me to describe myself, and I say, okay, you know, uh, I, you know, I was born and raised here, and I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, I've been an educator all my life, this is what I do, this is what I enjoy doing. You know, and most people understand kind of like this big picture idea about me. So each one of us has our own image of ourselves, which may not actually be the same as what other people think about us. But we're talking about our self, self-image, you know. Um, so um, there, there are things that we see in ourselves sometimes that are not so positive. Sometimes we see our own weaknesses. In fact, we see our weaknesses better than everybody else can because we know about them. Nobody else may know, but we know. Some people will say, oh, I'm too short. Uh, I'm too skinny. I'm too fat. You know, My head is crooked or whatever. We see all these things about ourselves that we may not like. And that actually contributes a lot to our self-image. Um, that necessarily means that other people see those same things in the same way. Something that may bother you about you may not bother other people about you at all, or vice versa. Something that you have long accepted about yourself really bothers other people. And you don't know that, So, but we're talking about your self-image. Um, now, um, a lot of times our self-image uh, is tied to the idea of comparing ourselves to other people. A lot of times we we look at other people and we say, well, this is what I'm like and this is what they're like. And then a lot of times we have these you know, feelings and thoughts about wanting to be more like somebody else. Sometimes we don't like ourselves so much. We like somebody else and we want to be like them. And, and so... That could be not always healthy because we can become obsessed with trying to be somebody else. But if you're ever going to struggle with this, you know, being yourself is always best. Uh, uh, being other people doesn't work. It only works to a degree, you know. But um, so as we imagine ourselves, a lot of times we 
see our problems, see our issues, see whatever we feel are weaknesses, not strengths. And then we compare ourselves with others. And then we also define ourselves as our culture tells us to define ourselves. So for example, like, you know, give an example in America, a lot of times people define themselves by their job titles. And your occupation is not necessarily who you are. Your occupation maybe is how you make money, but it's not who you are. Let's be honest about it. Some of us actually have great hobbies and wonderful things that we do that are just hobbies. They're not how we make money. Somebody may be a dancer, right? They love dancing. It's a huge part of their life. They enjoy it. It's a wonderful hobby. And when they think of themselves, they think of themselves as a dancer, but they're actually working at the accounting desk. Because guess what? They don't make enough money in dancing. So it's not their job. So if they were to describe themselves to somebody else, they're not going to say, I'm an accountant. I do taxes. <laughs> They'll say, I am a dancer. I love to dance. My job is accounting, but that's just what I am. So uh, a lot of times our culture infuses upon us these ideas of how we should see ourselves or how we should define ourselves. A lot of times people meet each other and the first thing they do is exchange business cards and all it tells them is where they work, right? It doesn't really tell them who they are. So, um, and, um, and therefore there's these cultural, sort of say, uh, issues that we have to change sometimes because sometimes our culture tells us how we should present ourselves to the world. Um, let's see, there's a couple more issues here, self-interpretation, self-evaluations. Uh, let's see how I can explain those things in a simple way. I mean, um, I think it's, I, I think, um, I mean, I think it's, it's fairly intuitive, but Let's, let me ask you this question. Um, how well do you, do you think you know yourself? Do you think you know yourself pretty well? Not really. No. Not really? <laughs> About 7 percent. Huh? 7 percent, I think. 7 percent. <laughs> okay, good. You guys read the chapter. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, the degree to which you know yourself uh, is not necessarily always precise. We sometimes think we know ourselves, but we really don't. Uh, how do you think, um, what do you think is one of the best ways to know yourself? If you wanted to learn about yourself, if you really wanted to know yourself, what would you do? Mm -hmm. uh, ask to my friends about myself, how they see me. Yes. And my, why do you think that's important? What would be the, your preferred way? Couldn't you just like sit down and think really hard about yourself and come up with a few good answers? Why would you go ask your friends? What I do you think? think? They're uh, um, perspec uh, different perspectives. Yes. To see who it is. Um, I think they can see myself, but I cannot see myself. Oh, really great. So there are things of yourself that you cannot see. Yeah. And what is what does the textbook call that? Um, yeah, the answer is right there on the PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm giving you easy, I'm making it easy for you guys. Yeah. Blind self, exactly. So talk to me about blind self. What do you think that means, Siri? Blind self. I'm talking about blind self. place of unconscious mm -hmm. and then Just to speak out what's in your mind, it's okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. I want your opinion. Where I can't 
realized myself. Right. Yeah. So th there are some things that you do, do not see about yourself. Why do you think that there are some things that you do not see about yourself? Mm -hmm. You think about it, it's you. Yeah. If anybody should know about you, it should be you, right? Yeah. Well, why can't you? some ideas. Why can't you see yourself, you know, better? Let's put it away. What stops you? Just think with me out loud. That's all I'm asking. Hey, you guys are welcome to jump in. Help her out. She's stuck. Help her out. What do you think? It's a question to everyone. I know I put her on a spot, which is not fair, but I do that sometimes. <laughs> time. You must forgive me. Why can't we see ourselves? Why? Why can't we see within ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, what's blocking us? Think about it. What is going on within us that there's things that you should know yourself better than everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Hypothetically. I mean, who else can know you better than you? But yet, at the same time, you say, if I really want to know myself, I'm going to ask my friends. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because there's some things about me that I don't always know or see or notice or realize. So it, it is an extremely valuable way of learning of how other people see you is asking other people. Very, very valuable. Most people never do this in their life. Some people are scared of it. They don't want to know how the world sees them, because exactly the types of things that I'm talking about. This is this idea of blind self. We are, some things about ourselves we have a hard time accepting. Mm -hmm. We'd like for them not to be true. We know it, kind of deep inside, but a lot of times we bury it. We don't want to talk about it. Um, so look with me at, um, at the window diagram right here. Um, this is something that um, I want you guys to understand. As you can see, it's broken up into, into chunks, into these pieces, these, these window panes, okay? There are, on one side is things that you know, and on other side, there are things that are unknown to you. So, uh, the open self is the information that, um, about yourself that you and others know. Everybody knows that you are this, you are that, and you know that about yourself. It's kind of like open, open. it's public knowledge. Everyone knows. But then there are some things that you know about yourself that others do not know, okay? Um, they don't know. What is the possibility, you know, like the, the green part, you know, what is the possibility that some of your friends do not know that you like a certain type of music or that you like a typical, a certain type of art or a certain type of literature or they do not know that you do not like that one person that everybody else likes. You can't stand them. Now, not everybody's going to know about this, right? Because you keep those things to yourself. You know it, but you're not comfortable sharing it with everyone. Or maybe you don't want to share it because maybe that's going to make you unpopular or weird or everyone's going to judge you. If you really tell them how you truly think deep inside, you may realize that you're going to face some rejection or judgment by other people. So there are things that you know about yourself, things you like, things you don't like, things uh, that you believe that you just don't tell others. Okay, so that's that another window of our personality. And so the world sees us this way, but in reality there's something hidden within us that we don't reveal on purpose Be for various reasons. Our reasons are our reasons, but we just don't reveal it, okay? 
And that doesn't mean that's not who you are. It is actually who you are. You're just choosing not to show it. You're just choosing to hide it, you know, to conceal it for various reasons. So that's what you know about yourself. But then there's a whole other part, okay? The other side of the window is things that are not really known to self. And you say, how is that possible? Well, there's information about yourself that you don't know, but others know. Now, you may not realize this, um, that you're a procrastinator. You may not think about it to yourself because maybe you haven't realized it yet, for example. Everyone says, if you were to ask people, you know, uh, does this person come to, you know, on time everywhere? And they're gonna say, oh no, they're late every single time everywhere they go. They never come on time, ever. They're always late. They'll be late to their own funeral, people say in America. <laughs> you know, it's a funny saying, but you know, they're always late, never come on time. And a lot of people who are like that do not ever think of themselves as being late. They think they're always on time. They see do not, they do not see that problem. If anybody tells them, you always come late, you're never on time, they would be like, no, no, I'm always on time. As far as they're concerned, they're just fine, okay? They don't know that they're habitually late to everything, and they don't even know that it annoys everybody, because as far as they're concerned, they're okay. Or, you know, turning in, you know, work late. So I, I have some students who never turn on their work on time. I have some students who have never, ever turned in any assignment on the day that it was due. They never turn it in. They always late, every single assignment. And I tell them that, I said, you have a problem with time management, you're, you're a procrastinator, you need to do your work a little bit ahead of time, so you turn it in. And they're like, no, not me. <laughs> I'm like, well, just look at the record I have. Not one assignment is on time. What does that tell you about yourself? You have something. And what the problem is, this is their blind self. They're not willing to admit to themselves that they actually have a problem because that doesn't make them feel good. So they pretend that everything is fine. And they and, and they've pretended for so long that they're not willing to see it and they can't see it. And that's it. So that's that area. We all have these areas about our blind cells that we just don't know. Everybody else knows this about us, but we don't. Some people would say, oh, that person is like the life of the party. Every time we invite this person, they make it fun. They, they have a blast, they help everybody have fun. Now there are people who are like that who do not realize that they are like that. They just like, they just say, oh, I'm just me. I'm just doing what I always do. They don't realize that they have a positive effect on the environment when they walk into a room. When they walk into a room, things start having, start being more enjoyable for other people. They don't realize it. So whether it's negative or positive, we can be actually blind to various aspects of our self that we don't know. We may have positive features in our life, we may have negative things in our life, and we are clueless that this is how we are. Now, there is this other part, the unknown self, okay? And that's information about yourself that neither you nor others know. And it's a little bit more difficult to dig through, but let's consider it this way. There are some things that you do not know you have within you. You may have a potential within you you do not realize you have. You may have a talent or a gift you do not realize you have. And other people do not know about it either. They are not able to see it as well. Now at some point in your life, it may manifest itself. And it may become first known to other people. And then sometimes later maybe to you. Sometimes we are late to catch up to the things that we discover about ourselves. Other people figure it out faster than we are because they observe us, which is the whole point of asking other people, oh, what do you think I'm like? Describe me, you know, to me, <laughs> is what you're actually asking. And that helps us to discover this part right here. I mean, there are things that, that we don't know about ourselves and nobody else knows about ourselves. And it could be connected to the fact that we're kind of hiding certain things, okay? We're not revealing certain parts of our personality to just everyone. 
So uh, that, that aspect is, you know, a little bit tricky. But you could see how the value of asking other people to describe us allows us to see these areas that we don't always see about ourselves. So uh, one of the things that this happens actually in our world today, uh, you can see this a lot. You guys heard about LinkedIn ever? It's a business network, kind of like Facebook for business people basically, okay? Uh, and you get connected on LinkedIn and people recommend you for certain skills. They say, oh, that person is good at this or that person is good at that. And so if you have a lot of connections, if you have like hundreds of people who are you connected with and assuming those hundreds of people actually know you, they kind of evaluate your profile and the system suggests different things about you and people click, oh, that person is good at art, oh, that person is good at language, that person is good at this type of business, that person is good at this type of business. So everybody kind of gets to click and like vote, almost like a vote. And mm -hmm. so in the end, on your profile, what happens is you see all these categories that show up that you didn't come up with, that people have rated you higher or lower in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you see like, oh, I'm really highly rated in this area. I'm not so highly rated in this area. And you think about yourself and you say, wait a minute, I think of myself as really highly rated in this area, but nobody else notices. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks I'm really good at this, but nobody says I'm good at that, but I know I'm good at that. And that's where you realize that your public image of how people see you is not always the same of how you see yourself. Even when it comes to actual business skills, your own competences that you think I'm really good at this, well, nobody else apparently knows that you're good at this because maybe you haven't had a chance to show it or, or maybe you haven't performed that you know, action in front of them and so they can't say that you're good at that. When they think about you, they don't associate that with, with you. They associate that maybe with somebody else, but not you. So that's very valuable, like to even to me in, in business and in, in professional life. A lot of times I see the kind of skills that people rate me at and I'm like, you know what? There's a reason why I'm not getting rated highly right here. Maybe I need to focus more on this in my area of life so that, so that people start noticing. I really am good at this area too. Uh, but for some reason, they don't notice that about me right now. So it's good, it's good stuff. So what do you guys think? Is this helpful? Is this little visual presentation, is that helping you out? Make sense? Yeah. Are there examples in life that you can think of um, that you know kind of fit into this window any stories any examples any thoughts because I'm telling you stuff like from my life right so I'm sharing you but so so feel free to to throw some in can you think of any examples from your life or experience uh, that kind of illustrate how this window works Anything that anybody sometimes told you about yourself that you were surprised to find out ever? Has that ever happened? Tell me about it. I want to hear about it. I want to hear a real life example. Because here's the deal. If I'm teaching you stuff, and this is all theoretical, you know how much it's worth? Nothing. If this is all just theory, it's worth nothing. Because I can fill your minds with stuff. They may be not true. It's only worth something if it's actually true. So I'm asking you for real life examples. And I'm trying to give you real life examples from my experience, from my life. But I want to hear some real life examples from your experience in your life. Because I'm, I'm hoping that in some way, shape, or form, if this is true, this has happened to you. Or you can give me an example of, even if it's not you, even if it's your friend, you know, whatever. You can give me an example from your life. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to get after. So any examples? You guys have anything for me? Hmm? Don't have to tell me about your hidden self or anything like that. We're not there yet. <laughs> but have there been life situations where, you know, you realize that there's something that, you know, you're good at that nobody knows about or, or vice versa. Everybody knows that you're good at something and you're like, what, really? 
I never thought of that. In my case, um, yeah. I think uh, I'm kind of negative person uh -huh. myself. Uh, while um, many converse conversation with my friend or teacher. Mm -hmm. They say uh, you're not negative person. Just uh, you're sensitive person. Okay, you're a sensitive person. Okay. Yeah. Um, back in time, I was changing thinking of mine. Okay. Yeah. So you were told that you were sensitive, where you didn't think of yourself that way at all. <laughs> and now you're changing your mind about yourself. Okay, that's yeah. a good example. It's a good example. That's I good. I think it is. It was blind self. Right. Arena. People knew this about you, yeah. but somebody else had to tell you in order for it to go to you understand to to transfer to that window. <laughs> yeah. That took that took somebody else telling you about that. That's good. I mean, these things happen to us, and this is part of the human experience. It's part of human growth. Which is why it's it's important to to interact with others. Now, how does this apply? Because this happens in communication. If you don't communicate, that is not going to happen. You know, interaction is what makes it happen. This is why this is important. We're talking about this. This is not a psychology course. You know, <laughs> it's a communication course. But in communication is when these things come out. And that's good. That's good. Ah, all right. Now let's work on another topic here. Let's see. Let's talk a little bit about self-disclosure. Self-disclosure, self-esteem. Um, so we talked about self-awareness. You thinking about yourself, what you are, who you are, what you're really all about. Um, let's talk a bit about self-esteem and self-disclosure. Let's see if I've gone a little bit too far. So self-esteem is defined, um, we could say that, you know, includes these features of how valuable you think you are, self-esteem. The word to esteem means to value, okay? So self-esteem is how valuable you are. Uh, and, and there are different strategies of how we can increase our self-esteem. Now, some people have very low self-esteem. They don't think they are important. They don't think they're worth anything. They don't think they do much. In fact, they think if they disappear right now, nobody's gonna notice. Some people feel that way. And it leads to serious, serious problems in their lives, actually. Um, and um, a healthy self-esteem will realize that there is a worth and value to, to everyone. And so there are, sometimes people struggle with this issue, and so there are ways to increase your self-esteem that the textbook actually offers. And, and I definitely recommend looking at those because they're worthwhile. I think a lot of people struggle with self-esteem. A lot of times we struggle with self-esteem because te people don't tell us how much uh, we matter, how much we're worth. Sometimes uh, parents sometimes talk down to their children and they tell them about how much they don't matter, unfortunately. That's sad. You know, good parents said try to lift a child and not to over, so to say, give them overconfidence. Because I've met kids who think that, you know, they make the world go round. Every once in a while I may meet a 12-year-old who thinks that they're the president of the world. And I have to tell them, I said, well, maybe in your family you are. <laughs> you know, but for the rest of us, now you're just a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> and that's about it. And I really don't care how important your father is or anything like that because it doesn't affect my world. Now, in his world, everybody's like, oh, you know, you're important, you're special. But I'm like, oh, you just walked into my world and in my world, you're not. So, people, some people have inflated sense of self-esteem. Other people have deflated self-esteem. They struggle with it. They realize that they're not important anywhere. And the truth is that 
Each one of us is important in our own context. We may not be important in somebody else's world, but we are important in our world where we are. And so there is an esteem to us where we are, but not everybody can see it from where they are. So that's, that's, an, that's another aspect uh, for us to explore. Uh, to explore. Let's talk a little bit about self-disclosure. What is self-disclosure? What do you think about self-disclosure? How would you define it for me? <clears throat> if self-awareness is all about you being knowing who you are, and self-esteem is about you understanding your own value, whether other people understand their own value doesn't really matter. It's the fact that you know about yourself, your own value. That's what's important. What is self-disclosure? Just in your own words. Think out loud. Come on, guys. What is self-disclosure? How would you explain that to me? Imagine that I have no idea, and I'm one of your classmates, and we're sitting reading this book together, and I'm like, explain to me your self-disclosure. I did not get it. Come on. Um, explain it to me. Can you explain it to me? I think it, it just introduces myself. Introduce yourself. Okay. So self-disclosure is about introducing yourself. All right, that's good. Um, do we all um, disclose ourselves in the same way? How much do you really know about me? Let's put it that way. How much do I really know about you? How much do you think you have self-disclosed yourself to me? And there's some people in this room that might know more about you than I do, right? So, self-disclosure is the, not just an introduction, but perhaps a level or a degree to which you really introduce yourself. Because if you think about it, some people know you better and some people don't know you at all. And it's probably like that because you want it to be. You're okay with that. There's some people that need to know you better. And other people don't need to know you. So you don't tell them everything about your life. Why? Because it's not their business. Why do they need to know? You, they're not related to you, they're not close to you, you're not close to them, why should they know, right? So that's that's what we're talking about, self-disclosure. You have something to add? No? Yeah. Go uh, ahead, it, bring it on. It's instinct, instinct um, anyone has. It's an instinct? Yeah. Okay. So self-disclosure is, it is, there is a certain instinctual nature to self-disclosure, all right? Um, let's talk about it. So the authors of this textbook define self-disclosure as communicating information uh, about yourself to another person. That's a very simple way of explaining it. Communicating information about yourself to another person. Um, how much we choose to communicate is usually dependent on a level of a relationship we have. Some people know a lot about you, other people don't. And that's okay. And that's what we call self-disclosure. In a sense, you have certain measure of control of how much you're gonna let people know about you. You have certain measure of control. You don't have all of the control, but you have a measure of control. Do you think you're in control? Of Letting information out about yourself to other people. Like if you don't want other people to know you, do you think you can hide who you really are from other people? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's possible to a degree. I think it is possible, but I think it also is true that there are some things that we do that people can observe about us and they can learn who we are by simply watching us without us communicating explicitly and telling them who we are. They can kind of figure this out by watching us, by being around us, by watching us talking to somebody else. 
they can figure out. In a sense, you can almost like spy on a person and figure out who they really are without them telling you. You know, just follow them around, see what they eat, see what they drive, see who they talk to, see who their friends are, and all of a sudden, you kind of know about them, and they haven't told you one single thing about themselves, right? Um, so self self disclosure is a very kind of you know interesting um, aspect. Sometimes people feel that they can tell things about themselves to somebody they meet. Other times they don't feel comfortable telling uh, truths about themselves to other people. And much of that is connected to the depth of our relationship with another person. So, like, you know, our relationship between a teacher and a student really depends on how many classes they have together, how close they are, you know, how much time they spend around each other. A relationship between a husband and a wife, like how much can husband and wife hide from each other? If they're close to each other, they're probably gonna know each other much better, right? So things like that. But a relationship between like an employer and employer is gonna be very different. And it's possible that the employer might not know anything about the employee besides their name and the job they do or something like that. And not much more, but whether they're good or not, that's about it. So there's degrees to which we choose to reveal things about ourselves to other people. Some people are more open by nature and other people are more closed by nature. And that depends on partially on your personality uh, and that partially depends on your culture as well. Uh, very, I think for some people it depends very highly on their culture, okay? Um, so in this chapter on self-disclosure, something that the authors highlight is they highlight the overt and the carefully planned statements that we make. Um, and uh, the slips of the tongue. And then there's the nonverbal disclosures, okay? Like the wedding rings, you know, or political t-shirts and things like that. Um, and a lot of times people learn about us in an indirect way. If you see a person wearing a wedding ring, right? So you're like, oh, oh, he's married. So like, I didn't walk around and say, hey, I'm married, hey, I'm married. You just saw that ring, you're like, oh, he's married. Okay, so that's that's what it means. So uh, sometimes you see divorced people walking around with the wedding rings because they don't want to take it off. Because even though they're technically divorced, they don't feel like it's over for them. In their mind, they still are. And they can't get over that. And they, so they still wear it. Because like in cult, American culture, if they take it off, that could be perceived as, hey, I'm not married, right? I'm available. And they're like, no, I'm not available. I want everybody to think I'm married. Even though I'm not, I want everybody to think I am. So they leave me alone. That's a way of communicating with the world that's very indirect, okay? So there are things that we do. There are things that we say sometimes that reveal um, aspects of our personality, who we are, kind of slips of the tongue, a joke. Sometimes you think like, oh, that's a, that's a very decent person. And all of a sudden, you go to lunch and you, they, they sit at, at that table next to you and they start telling a joke to their friend and that joke is just terrible. It's just nasty, it's awful, it's very off color, very inappropriate. And you're like, wow, I really thought that person was like really good, kind of moral, very high ethical person. What are they doing telling a joke that's so inappropriate you know, to somebody else? And all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, I just learned something. Again, that person wasn't communicating that about themselves on purpose. They did it by accident, but you learned it. And now your perception of that person is forever colored by what you've experienced, by the things you've heard, the things you've seen. So a lot of times we communicate, we disclose ourselves without even realizing we're disclosing ourselves. We're being ourselves, right? We're not that we're not talking about the hidden self part, we're, talk, we're just being ourselves. Not really telling people this is who I am, but they discover it by being around us. And they build an image of us. 
And then if they start telling us this is what we are, there's some things again that we may not like about them. And that's the blind part that we don't know what we are actually even portraying or advertising. So, so self disclosures does um, does vary. Um, so you you can see people um, communicate online. Like people when people communicate online, they're much more cautious about telling people about themselves. When they communicate in real life, they are much more open. Um, uh, as I said, it's all about relationships. You may feel comfortable telling somebody you know really well things about yourself, um, while you don't want to tell a complete stranger things about yourself. Uh, so why? Because you want to present a certain image. You want them to think better of you than maybe who you really are. But then the people who know you really well, well, there's really not fooling, no fooling them anyway. So you might as well admit to them what's true anyway. So that's, that's kind of a dynamic of self-disclosure. But with self-disclosure, there are risks and there are rewards. What do you guys think about the risks and rewards of, uh, of self-disclosure? Is it good? Is it beneficial to tell everybody everything about yourself? No. No. So what? tell me, talk, tell me more about the risks and rewards. Let's talk about it. What are some of the dangers and what are some of the benefits of self-disclosure? Why would I not tell you everything about myself? Just think. Why would you not tell me everything there is to know about you? Why? Why not? Just think out loud. Let it out. This is a discussion. There's no right or wrong answer. In the process of our discussion is where we establish reason and truth. You know, but if you guys don't let it out, then it's difficult for me to have a no starting point. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? Let me in on your thoughts. Is it okay to let everybody know everything about you? If it's not, why? Why would you not let everybody know? Give me a reason, or two, or three, or five, or however many you got. You meet a stranger in the street, and they say, can I have your phone number? And you say, no. Why would you say no? It is our privacy. It's private? So what is it? So why, so why, why not give me a phone number? What's the big deal? <laughs> Tell me why. Why would you not give me a phone number? Um, we don't know each other not yet. So people at the phone store know your phone number. They don't know you at all. Why can't I have it? <laughs> just, just play with it. Play, play, play with me. Come on. Let's have fun. Why can't I have it? I'm a stranger on the street. Can I have your phone number? <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> Why? I don't know you. So what? I don't know you either. I'll give you mine. Here. Here's mine. You know? Why would you not? What would be a reason in your mind? guys talk to me <laughs> just think out loud just just let it out let it out of your head <laughs> why would you not give a, a complete stranger your phone number or something sometimes like that? our personal information can be used uh, for criminal things that's yeah you're like i don't uh, know you why, why would I, you want my phone uh, i didn't intend it to use it right okay so you know while technically speaking it's not going to hurt if I found out your phone number or anybody found out your phone number, right? Except that maybe I just decide to call you all the time just to annoy you, right? 
and you're like, get away from me, I don't know you, I don't want to know you. But I'm getting into your life now. I'm bothering you, I'm texting you. Stupid stuff, all the time. And you're like, no, this is for friends. This is not just for anybody. You know? And just think with me on some of the reasons. Why would you want to protect certain things about yourself that you don't know? You're like, like, hi, you know, I don't know you. Can you tell me where you live? Can I have your address now, please? Can I have your address? And you're like, no, you can't have my address. Why would you not give me your address? They are just stranger and then they can be like a stalker or... They can be a stalker. Yeah, maybe, maybe I think uh, you're hot and now I'm going to set, set up my camera right in front of your apartment and spy on you all the time. I mean, who knows what's going on in my mind? You don't know me, so you don't want to give it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming out with at least one possibility out there. Why would you not do that? There is a certain danger that the information that you give to people will be used against you. Right? That's what we are really afraid of. That the more you know about me, the more you can use that against me. Right? All sorts of questions people ask, sometimes very personal questions. And you're like, mm, not you, because I don't trust you yet. Maybe in two years when we become good friends, my answer will be, you could have that information. But right now, I don't know you, I don't trust you, no. But my friends who have known me all this time, they can know that. But you, you can't know that, because I don't know you, and I don't know how you're going to use it, I don't trust you, maybe you'll use it wrong. Maybe I tell you something private about myself, and you tell everybody else, and I don't want everybody else to know that. See what I mean? That's, that's a little bit of an issue. So, um, the more people know about us, the more they can use that information against us. And this is why a lot of times people do not self-disclose certain things about themselves. Okay? Because it makes us vulnerable. It makes us vulnerable. Why do people in a family have the most complicated relationships there are? Why do husbands and wives, children and parents, fight the most? You're laughing because it's true, you know that, you know that's true. The biggest conflicts that we have between people, right, are not you and strangers. It's you and your family, the people that know you the best, your best friends that you had for however many years. Those are the people you have the biggest problems with. And the reason is, they know so much more about you. And you know so much more about them becomes very easy to hurt each other using that information against them okay so that's you know that's a big that's a big uh, downside of self-disclosure which is why people do not disclose themselves to everyone else because I don't want you to have something that might potentially hurt me or you may use against me so I don't disclose it but tell me is it possible to have a true meaningful relationship without self-disclosure. Can people be in love and keep developing that relationship and not tell things that are very private to each other? Can people have a deep friendship and not tell things about themselves to somebody else? Who's their friend? What do you think? Possible or not possible? possible? Is it possible to have a true deep friendship or a true deep loving relationship with somebody when you're not sharing something about yourself? I'm not saying everything, but some private things, intimate things, things that you don't want the whole world to know. But you gotta trust them. A little bit, right? Yeah. And when you disclose these private things to them, 
that makes them feel like they trust me. So, which in return allows them to do the same. To disclose private things about themselves. So, you know, I have friends that I've known for many, many years, and I know what's going on in their family life and their marriages. If they're having trouble, you know, I know. Why? Because they share these things with me. And that's okay, because they know that I'm going to keep it private. Because our friendship is long, and I haven't been telling them everything about their life. Nobody else knows. It's private. So they, they know they can trust me to, tell, to share some of the things that they're struggling with, for example, in their life with me, because I'm not going to go and tell everybody else. I will understand, and I will perhaps share of how some of these things can be overcome or dealt with and things like that from my perspective. And so they're safe. And so in the same way, I could share certain private things with them, knowing that I hold private information about them and they hold private information about me and neither one of us are interested of that becoming public, right? So we have that trusting relationship and our self-disclosure is really high because we're, we both are in a position to know very, very private things about each other. And that, but that creates a relationship of trust and intimacy, actually. You're, you're able to trust these people and have a deep relationship. Whether with other people, you can't. So that's the idea. So self-disclosure, um, once you let people know, like any other communication, the author says, is, is irreversible. That's important. Um, you definitely cannot take it back. Once people know something about you, no taking it back. That's just normal communication, okay? Um, self-disclosure, the guidelines that the authors give us is consider the motivation for, for the self-disclosure, like why would you tell somebody something about yourself? Consider the appropriateness of self-disclosure. Sometimes people tell you things about them and it's not appropriate, okay? Like, basically, you don't have a close enough relationship and they start telling you stuff that's going on. And you're like, why are you telling me that? I don't need to know that. We're not that close of friends for me to know such private, intimate details, you know? about your life. And so uh, it says consider the disclosures of the other person also like what they're saying, you know, consider why are they doing that? And then consider the possible burdens self-disclosure might entail. Because when you tell people something about you, that changes their perception of you now, which is part of the reason why we do not self-disclose. We don't want to have the person of control of forming their own opinion about us. We want to be able to control that. And once you know something about somebody else, it becomes, it becomes a part of how you see them now. So this is all we do in communication. I mean, I know you haven't thought about it that much because most people don't, but this is something we do. And sometimes we do it purposefully, sometimes we do it even without being truly 